From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, this is Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. In just a moment, we're going to be speaking with Fred Provenza about his new book, Nourishment. But first, this announcement. Chelsea Green Publishing, an employee-owned company, is recognized as a leader in content about organic farming and gardening, homesteading, local food systems, restorative living, regenerative agriculture, and diet-focused integrative health, publishing expert authors that bring in-depth practical knowledge to life in books, ebooks, and audiobooks. Go to chelseagreen.com and enter code DTE30 at checkout to receive a special Down to Earth podcast discount on your next print book purchase. And be sure to sign up for their newsletter and stay up to date on all their new releases. Chelsea Green Publishing, cultivating change from the ground up. I'm very happy now to welcome Fred Provenza. He's a professor emeritus in the Department of Wildland Resources at Utah State University, and he's author of the new book, Nourishment, What Animals Can Teach Us About Rediscovering Our Nutritional Wisdom. Welcome. Thank you very much. Wonderful to be with you. This is a terrific, really wide-ranging book that explores a lot of different landscapes, creatures, people, ideas, emotions, personal experiences, scientific realities, all around the theme of nourishment. And I thought we could start with this amazing story of somebody named Clara Davis. Who was she and what did she discover? Clara was a researcher in Canada, and she did work nearly a hundred years ago now, that is fascinating to me because of some of the work that we did that really paralleled work like Clara was doing. So Clara had the opportunity to be working with people in an orphanage where children were being given up for adoption at birth. And I don't know how she got interested in this or why she wanted to do it, but she was very interested in the ability of these young children to self-select their own diet and meet their needs. That was the question she asked. And so as it turns out, she ran a six year study, which from a human nutrition clinical trial kind of viewpoint is, is unheard of. It's just impossible to do that. So six years and she worked with 15 children. And what she did was to offer them 34 foods that were available in the marketplace, basically wholesome kinds of foods that would be available year round. And she simply offered those foods to the children free choice. And what she found was that the children were indeed able to select diets that met their needs with no input from nutritionists or um, medical doctors or anything else. She had a pediatrician who was monitoring the children. And I've read articles that the pediatrician wrote about Clara's studies, and he said he never saw a healthier group of children. When we were doing studies with cattle in particular, we ran a series of trials where we were either offering cattle free choice ingredients in separate food buckets or forcing them to eat what's referred to in nutrition circles as a total mixed ration. And what that is, is where the ingredients are ground and mixed together so that the animals can't select. So the animals that were giving a choice, what we found is that they were able to select diets, even with a very limited number of choices, four foods we were offering them. They were eating less food than the animals that were given no choice at all. But here's where I'm going to tie back to what Clara did. And it was almost like we were plagiarizing words that she'd written in her articles many years ago, because we found, as she did, no two animals ever selected the same foods. No animal ever selected the same foods from day to day. But every animal was able to select a combination of foods that best met its needs. And that's basically what Clara was finding. She also found that if kids came in with deficiencies, for instance, rickets, they would select foods uh, like cod liver oil that helped them to meet their needs. And once their needs had been met, they uh, no longer ate so much of those particular foods. So all that's illustrating in her studies, what we illustrated in our studies over the last 40 years, 
is that animals have an incredible ability to self-select diets to meet their needs when they're offered a variety of wholesome alternatives. And those children were eating things like brains and bone marrow and stuff that, you know, we're not used to eating that kind of stuff, but they went straight to it. And that experience of, for example, they liked cod liver oil when their bodies needed it, and then they didn't really like it anymore when their bodies didn't need it. You had a similar experience as a child when you had the mumps. You were craving foods that you normally didn't like and afterwards didn't like either. Right, right. And all of that illustrates then the way that the body will will move us in a direction given a variety of choices that is necessary to meet needs. And those needs are really at the level of cells and organ systems, including the microbiome. People are very, very interested now in the microbiome and the role that it plays in nutrition and health and in the feedbacks that the microbiome provides so that we select foods that meet their needs. Well, that's very important, but it's important also to realize it's not just the microbiome that's doing that. That's hap- that feedback is coming from cells and different organ systems of the body, the hearts, the lungs, the brain. All those systems have needs, and that feedback then, that what we refer to as feedback, is mediated by neurotransmitters, peptides, hormones, and on and on and on. We don't need to get into those details here, but it's simply to say there are ways that 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 feedback occurs, and then that changes our liking for the flavors of foods as a function of what those cells and organ systems need. That's really a, a key part of all of this. So this story tells us that there's no tidy category called a healthy diet. And not only that, but as you say, on any given day, a healthy diet for one person or animal might be different from a healthy diet the next day for that same person or animal. And this seems to be true across all kinds of creatures. And one of the pieces of all that is variety. How important is variety in and of itself? And how detrimental is a lack of variety? in our diet? I think variety really is important. What comes to mind when you raise that question are the different camps. I was struck as I wrote Nourishment and really tried to get my arms around the scientific literature on human food selection, nutrition, and health, how there's such different, divergent, different kinds of views, not only in the scientific literature, but obviously in the popular literature that's written related to this topic. But regardless of which camp a person's in, I think that variety can have so many benefits for health and nutrition. It's certainly the case with domestic and wild herbivores, the kind of animals that we studied. Variety is, I think, fundamental to health that the the old saying, let food be thy medicine, ring so true in that sense. You know, we studied the diets of cattle, sheep, goats, elk, bison, wild domestic animals, and they all like to eat a variety of foods. It's amazing if you just take the time and follow them around a little bit and look, it blows your mind how many different species they'll eat in a day. It's nothing to eat 40, 50, 60 or more species of plants, a nibble here, a bite there, And we used to discount that some because we'd say, well, you know, three to five to seven species make up the bulk of the diet. That's what really matters. I don't believe that anymore, though, at all. I think when animals are eating this wide range of plants, that enables cells to forage. You know, if you think of a cell as foraging, it can only ingest what's in the capillaries. And when you have this diverse array of different compounds that are coming because animals take a nibble here, a bite there, I think that leads to health. It really becomes a prophylactic kind of way to engender health. And then we know with the domestic animals that if they really are suffering sickness of one sort or another, they can learn to self-select medicines that rectify those. And that's been shown in everything from insects to human beings. So this notion of variety then 
becomes important, I think, not only for herbivores, but for omnivores as well, and that includes us human beings as well. Eating a variety of wholesome foods, I think, is etiologic in health. We often focus, and this really struck me, we're all often always seems like looking for silver bullets. What's the compound that helps you with X or Y or whatever it is, omega-3 fatty acids or vitamin, particular vitamins or whatever. But one of the most interesting papers I read when I was reviewing the scientific literature on human beings was written by two people in Australia, researchers with medical backgrounds and so forth. And the title of their paper was Food Not Nutrient is the Basic Unit in Nutrition. And boy, reading through that paper, they just showed over and over again how the more you try to focus on specific kinds of compounds and encapsulate them, be that some herb like garlic or something like omega-3 fatty acids, the more the health benefits disappear. Their point and the point that strikes me so much is that health comes from synergies and synergies come from variety. Now, synergies are very hard to study scientifically because it's easy to study or easier to study a variable and isolate that one variable. But when you talk about 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 different compounds that might be in a particular vegetable or whatever, it's very hard to break it down and figure out how those synergies work, isn't it? Absolutely the case. That becomes really the huge challenge. And, uh, you know, the way we do reductionist science, uh, where we focus, and I mean, this isn't a throw the baby out with the bathwater or, or meant to be a strong critique, but we do focus on, on individual parts. And when you get to that point where, as you're mentioning, there'll be hundreds, if not thousands, of compounds that occur in any one particular food. You know, strawberry has 5,000 volatiles. That blows my mind to read about that. But I know in, in plants that we studied, like sagebrush, there's three pages of compounds, single space, that occur in these plants. So, so plants are elaborating tremendous, tremendous variety. And meat as well can have tremendous, tremendous kinds of variety of biochemically rich compounds, meat and fish and so forth. And so it really does become quite the challenge, if not impossibility. For certain, we, we would have to totally change our ways of thinking. As you know, later on in the book, I was talking at one point about some approaches people are taking now to trying to study some of the traditional like Chinese medicine, where they offer varieties of different herbs, uh, Ayurveda as well. The people who are doing some of that work from a pharmaceutical standpoint are, are really writing interesting papers about the challenges that we're talking about because of the, the higher order interactions that are probably involved in offering 12 different plant species as a way to prevent or to cure cancer and so forth it really becomes challenging. Well, one of the things that I thought was interesting is, I mean, you described this moment where you're a young man working on a ranch in Colorado, and the rancher that you're working for is of Italian origin. And so you're making all these sausages and different things with Italian herbs and spices, of which there are a lot. And you talk about how, you know, if you were to eat some of these meats by themselves, they might not be that good for you. But with all those herbs and spices in there, they are very healthy. In other words, those things all play a synergistic role with each other and with the meat. And those cultures figured it out a long time before the idea of synergy was even being studied. I mean, that's one of the things that I think is so kind of interesting and mysterious about this is cultures, whether it be Chinese herbs that have formulas that have 18 different herbs in it or or Italian food or whatever it is, there's a wisdom in those traditions that didn't come through scientific method. Absolutely the case. And it reveals then that there is this wisdom to the body that knows. I think at a fundamental level, 
And even though the science of it becomes incredibly, incredibly complex when you get into the biochemistry and the physiology of all this, it can blow your mind, actually. But it becomes very simple from the standpoint of what we do. If we're exposed to wholesome foods, then simply eating what tastes good and avoiding what tastes bad, which becomes unique to each one of us, as you were pointing out, it becomes as simple as that. And then you see how these cultures around the world figured out what worked and what didn't work from the standpoint of, as you're saying, meat with different spices that create these wonderful flavors that are much better than simply the meat alone. It's interesting that you raise that. I've been working on a paper for probably two years now that came out of nourishment. It's been accepted for publication in a scientific journal called Frontiers in Nutrition. And it's totally focused on the kinds of questions that you're asking. And it's making the point that not only do these spices, herbs and spices, enhance the flavor of meat and have health benefits that one can certainly argue, but the broader point is that the diets that livestock eat influence the biochemical characteristics of their meat and fat and the milk that comes out of that. And so an animal that's eating a total mixed ration that's high in grain in the feedlots is having much less phytochemical, as if you will, the diversity in its diet compared with an animal that's maybe on a pasture that has a handful of species. And that animal in turn is getting far less phytochemical complexity in its diet than an animal that's foraging on a landscape that has 100, 150, 200 different plant species. And we're arguing that as you go across that continuum, the quality and health benefits of the meat and fat and milk and cheese that's produced from that are enhanced as the phytochemical complexity of the diets of the herbivores are enhanced. And that makes life pretty complicated for us mere mortals who are trying to eat healthy food and to contribute to a regenerative and sustainable food system. So, for example, as you write about, you might go to a market and see, oh, grass-fed beef. So you know that it's not grain-fed beef, you know that it's out on some kind of pasture, but you still don't know what plants that animal ate, how diverse its pasture or range was. So it's still, I mean, it's still hard to navigate that. Well, it is, and I, you know, <laughs> we don't want to make it where it's, you know, makes you crazy on all of those kind of things, but, but it is, I think it is an interesting and very relevant point. And I, a friend comes to mind, Glenn Elzinga, who ranches over in Idaho, and he does some amazing practices. For one, throughout much of the year when his animals are on extensive rangelands, which, by the way, have up to 500 different plant species that those animals will utilize at different points in time, he has these shepherding practices where every day they're with the animals, moving them across the landscape. And what they're really doing is a couple of things. One is to enhance the health of those landscapes. They're grazing in ways that engender health of plants and encourage plant diversity by the way that they move animals and don't allow them to overutilize areas. For instance, riparian areas. Their riparian areas have really regenerated under the kind of management that they're doing. So that's one point. But the other point is that Glenn makes that relates so much to what we're talking about is that the biochemical complexity of the meat and fat of his animals is going to be different from those in feedlots. We know that and we're you know, Glenn's involved in some studies related to that. The other point that we make in this paper for Frontiers in Nutrition, and it comes out in, in nourishment as well, is that when you get diversity of plants, not only grasses, forbs, but the woody plants, the shrubs, as well as trees, willows and cottonwoods and aspens and that across landscapes, that has huge benefits in terms of climate change, fixing carbon from the atmosphere back into the soil. There's really some huge benefits that go with all of that. So 
I see plant diversity and plant phytochemical diversity as being so central to all life on earth, below ground, above ground. It engenders health of all communities. It engenders human health through its ripple effects through systems. It engenders the health of the planet through the ability of those plants to remove carbon from the atmosphere, for instance. So I, I think diversity, that question that you asked originally, I see diversity as, as so very important. Makes me think back 50 years ago when I was an undergraduate at Colorado State University in wildlife biology. I was taking classes in ecology which was totally new to me at that point. I'd never heard of it. And in fact, ecology was a fairly new discipline at that point. But even then, they were talking about the importance of diversity, that biodiversity is fundamental to, to health of systems. And I, I understood the words. I appreciated the words. I appreciated what Aldo Leopold talked about in Sand County Almanac, which they all had us read back in those days about those things. But I have to say, after 50 years of working in, in this area, I, I just so, so come to be a believer and a proponent because I can point to example after example from my own experiences now of how important I think that is. To complicate things even more, we have... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. yeah, okay, keep it going. <laughs> Well, I mean, we have we have this instinct which we humans have, which was demonstrated by these orphans in Canada who were eating a very healthy diet and cured themselves and healed themselves. And we have that on the land where wildlife and domestic animals are eating, if given half a chance, the foods that they really need in order to prevent illness and to stay healthy and to cure things when they've got health problems themselves. And on top of all that, there's culture. And so you grow up eating certain foods, whether you're a goat or whether you're a human or a cow, your mother ate certain things in utero that influence your tastes. There are cows that you write about who are used to eating a certain thing and they don't really, if they're given a whole new set of things, they're a little wary, like, where where am I now? Why am, am I supposed to eat this? What? A lot like we would be, or a lot like we are. So how does this overlay of culture, what we grew up eating, what we encountered in utero, what we encountered in our early life, how does that play in, especially if it's not healthy in the first place? The topic that you raise now is one of the ones that from when I went back to graduate school, interested me the most. I, I don't know why, it just was fascinating to think that mother would play an important role in offspring learning what and what not to eat. And as we showed where and where not to go, they learned food and habitat selection both from mother so we started studies on those kind of things and, and we started simply looking at mother as a model. Then we moved in, as you say, to this whole area of in utero, which we were thinking early on in our studies, well, we, we know that experience influences selection, so we'll start with young animals right after birth. And we kind of had not even thought about the in utero world. Well, come to find out, so much is happening in the womb with the fetus. The fetal taste system is fully functional during the last trimester of gestation. And so the foods that mother's eating and the flavors of those foods are getting into the amniotic fluid and starting to acquaint the young water creature with what's going to be the realities following birth. After birth, cues in mother's milk, again, from the flavors of foods that she's eating get into the milk. And then, of course, mother as a model, what and what not to eat and so forth. So we showed those kind of things over and over again in studies during our research. But there's also just an incredibly robust, amazing, interesting literature on human beings related to that. So that's well documented. And if mother is eating wholesome foods, then that's going to set the offspring on a track to be able to eat wholesome foods as well. 
But if mother's not eating wholesome foods, if mother's eating, for instance, a diet that's very high in processed foods, that's also going to set the offspring up to uh, have a preference for those kind of foods. And as this vast body of research on humans now shows, you know, if mother gains a lot of weight during pregnancy, excess in amount, or if mother's overweight and eating processed foods, all these sort of things, it really not only sets the offspring up to do those kind of behaviors, but it starts to change organ systems inside the body, the pancreas and uh, and insulin secretion, a, a whole variety of things get changed as a function of that. And we were certainly showing those kind of things in the studies that we did too, we and other people. So you have this learning in the womb, but you also have genes being expressed that are influencing the development of organ systems in terms of their form or morphology and in terms of their function or physiology. So you literally are changing animals one of the studies we did with an animal scientist that really was uh, amazing to me was to, you know, during the winter time, wild animals are forced, to, herbivores are forced to eat really poor quality kinds of forages. They're, they're very high in fiber, not too high in, in protein and so forth. And so the question we ask is if we expose mother to a diet like that while she's pregnant, does that change what her offspring does with the food after birth? And we were able to show that offspring of mothers that have been reared on that kind of diet not only eat more of that poor quality food, they're better able to digest that food. So their total digestible dry matter intake is better than animals that were on a different kind of diet, a higher quality diet, for instance. And so all that is showing with the herbivores we studied or with human beings is simply that you're having genes being expressed that are enabling a body to utilize the kind of diet that it's going to be challenged to use. So in any creature that's been looked at, these kind of changes take place. And this whole field of epigenetics, genes being expressed as a function of environmental experiences and then influencing, changing Morphology and physiology is so relevant to, to all of these kinds of things. Well, let's say, and talking about humans for a moment, let's say that somebody was born and their mother, while pregnant, ate Starbursts, Coke, potato chips, and chicken nuggets. That was her diet. And then that child grows up with a proclivity toward wanting those things. Where is the child's natural wisdom that in the example that we started with, Clara Davis and her kids who instinctively chose the right foods, does that get overlaid by these other things, the cultural and the in utero influences? Is it still buried there somewhere? I think it's still buried there, but it can very easily be hijacked. And the alternatives that become available to that young child after birth are going to really then influence whether that that initial experience plays out over a lifetime or whether that initial experience gets changed. The odds are that if mother is eating that kind of diet while she's pregnant, she's going to, she's going to have a house full of those kinds of foods. And so the child is really not going to have much of a chance. And so we see young children now with issues of overweight and obesity. On the other hand, though, if that were to change, if the child were to be plucked, and I'm not saying to do this, but, you know, like in Claire's case, these child, children were put into the orphanage and offered wholesome foods, and their bodies knew what to do. They, they had to figure it out. And as Claire pointed out, they didn't come just, quote, knowing she makes a big point that they sampled everything. They would put the spoons in their mouths. They would put napkins. They would put everything in their, in their mouth, and they would sample all of the foods early on. And then, given a little time, each child would hone in on what was the subset that at the time was working for it. And as we, we mentioned earlier, you know, from day to day, the child would vary that. So, so it's not to say that these kind of things can't be changed. And... Uh, you know, there are many, many good examples of changing dietary habits. It, it takes some work, but it, it can certainly be done. There's no question about that. 
Well, and it seems like it's tricky to do for a number of reasons because, I mean, besides the fact that we have the way we were raised and what we were born with and the culture that we're in, we're also pulled in this direction of what authority figures are telling us to eat, which can be politicized. And then another thing is the corporate food system, which is always trying to get us to eat things that aren't good for us by advertising and using tempting flavors that cover the poor quality of food. And so that question of how we establish for ourselves a healthy diet, there's a lot in the way. Honest to goodness, it's a minefield. It's a minefield out there. And uh, I'm forever struck and still following that literature very carefully about how much information comes out on a daily basis, actually, and how even in the scientific literature and even in outlets that I think are really try to do a good job, try to be fairly reputable. So I'm going to sound like the big judge and critic. I'm not meaning it to be that way at all, but there you don't find consensus. You just simply do not find consensus. So you could go crazy over this kind of stuff in the human foods and nutrition and, and all of that. But I, I do think that wholesome foods, so trying to figure out, and this takes some work, you know, as you were pointing out, meat isn't meat isn't meat. Vegetables aren't vegetables aren't vegetables. Fruit isn't fruit isn't fruit. So it really takes some work to figure out what are wholesome foods, even within those categories that we recognize are, are worthwhile, and where to source, you know, where do I want to source the foods that I get, the meat, for instance. I honestly think one of the things that, that's so worthwhile is simply growing your own foods. I know that's not for everyone. My wife and I have been doing it ever since we met and since those ranch days. We we just loved doing that. We loved gardens. We loved grow, raising our own animals. But then you you know where it comes from and you can think about varieties. You know, growing your own herbs. There's so much health in different herbs that, that we use in, in seasonings. And then you could even grow medicinal kinds of plants if a person gets into that uh, field a bit. But it, it, it takes effort. I, it's like everything in life, I guess. Uh, it takes some interest, first and foremost, and then some, some effort. But there can be just incredible rewards of, of working with that. And you can grow in a yard, a person can grow all the varieties of fruit trees and shrubs, fruiting shrubs. And there's a wealth of things that a person can do to help get in touch with foods and wholesome foods. And uh, certainly I think one consensus would be, if there is any, that, you know, a diet high in processed foods is really not a healthy diet. A little bit here and there, probably no problems, but boy, a diet of that just leads to poor health. And that's a good place for anybody to start as they start this exploration. One of the things, one of the stories in your book that just fascinated me was about a woman who had had a rare lung disease and she had a lung and heart transplant. And afterwards, she had completely different food preferences than she'd had before the transplant. Tell us about that. Yeah, Claire Sylvia's book, A Change of Heart, I that was a gem. When, when I found that one was later on in my career, it was well before I started to write Nourishment, which took 10 years to write that. But I thought, you know, for sure I need to talk about Claire's experience in that book. Her descriptions of what happened after that heart and lung transplant just are so captivating to me. She tells the story. She was one of the first ladies to have, have heart and lung transplant back in the day. And so it was a big deal when she did that. And there was a lot of news coverage and interest in that. And I, I remember one of her stories. She said she was on an exercise bike she was being interviewed, and at the end of the interview, they asked her, they said, well, if you could have anything you want to eat right now, what would you want? She said, well, quite honestly, I'd like a beer. And she said she felt badly after she said that for two reasons. One, it was such a flippant response to an honest question. And two, she said, I don't even like beer. And then she starts into talking about how her 
preferences had changed for all these different foods. And to me, it's so revealing then of what we were talking about earlier. We made the point that cells and organ systems are changing our liking for foods as a function of needs. And we said that these things start in utero and early in life. And so what Claire did was to track down who her donor was. It turned out to be, I think, a 21-year-old man. And she talked with the family. And, you know, some of the preferences that she developed were foods that he had uh, very, very strong liking for. And so these organ systems, in his case, her heart and her lungs, carried that preference with them. They, <laughs> that's what they, some of those foods and their chemical characteristics are what helped those organ systems to meet their needs. And so it isn't as though Claire quit liking the foods that she once liked. She still continued to like those, but her dietary habits and preferences had broadened to include those of her new organ systems, her heart and her her lungs. Now, is this something that is common in people who've had organ transplants? It is common. It is common. We can think of all this as very machine-like. And she makes that point in the book, you know, the heart is just a heart, it's a pump. That's all it is, one of the doctors told her. Well, you know, I don't believe any of that anymore. I don't see anything as machine-like. I see it as incredibly organic and forming relationships constantly among cells, organ systems, uh, individuals, environments, those sorts of things. And so what Claire did was, you know, it was traumatic for her to, it, we're talking about the food part, but she talks about all the other parts. She's, what, I think in her 40s, when she gets this heart and lung transplant, she's now put the heart and lungs of a 20-year-old male <laughs> inside of her body. And it was traumatic for her. And so she developed these support groups, and they'd get together and talk about what they were experiencing in the broadest sense too, but certainly that included their changes in dietary habits. And so in nourishment and and in her books, she gives many, many examples of the kind of changes that, that occurred when people got organ transplants. One of the things I appreciate about this book, Nourishment, is that you're holding different ways of thinking at the same time. So There is the whole way of thinking of science, which is an incredibly powerful tool. There's a way of thinking that says we are part of nature and need to really relearn to see ourselves in this way after centuries of mechanistic and reductionist thinking. There is a kind of expanding science that takes into account the reality that an organ that goes into an organ recipient like the example you were just talking about, is more than a machine, a pump, a mechanistic thing, but is something that contains cellular memory and its whole own like history and life story. We're using science in a way that other creatures don't. We have an overview. We have conscious understanding of things that other creatures don't really have in the same way. I'm looking at the subtitle of your book, Rediscovering Nutritional Wisdom. How do you think that science could move more in the direction of wisdom? That's a really a really good and a really big question actually, is it not? Uh, I think, you know, if we if we realize that uh, and there's I, I've seen this debate and kind of people getting after one another on both sides. There's the the proponents of reductionist kind of of science and what that can teach us. And then there's proponents that talk about holistic worldviews. Sometimes those two camps really kind of get after one another. Reductionist science learns more and more about less and less till it knows everything about nothing, for instance. And then you can go the other way with the holistic views. I think if we realize that parts create holes, create parts, create holes, it's not one or the other, it's the relationships that are really critical. And then to realize, like I point out later in the book about some of the groups 
that are trying to think about, well, how can we study Chinese medicine in ways that give credit to this huge knowledge that whether you can study it or not, how can we start to, to think about using science as a way to study things that are far more complex than we ever did? I think it's a little bit, and I'm not a quantum physicist for certain, not even in the universe of that, but I think it's going to take a mind change, a change in the way that we look at things, much like happened in quantum physics. And I loved back in the days reading Friedrich Capra's book, The Tao of Physics. I just loved the book because he was talking about when physicists started to go into that universe, it was so different from anything that we had ever experienced before. It just was mind-boggling. They had to totally change the ways that they thought about, looked at, conceived what was going on. And I really, I think that's going to need to happen with the way that we start to think about some of what you and I've talked about on these synergies and complexities related to health and move away from these silver bullet kinds of thought processes that we have. Every time, it seems to me that we try to find the answer, the bullet, the whatever, it just vanishes into nothing. I find that amazingly interesting and worthwhile, but I think we're going to, it's going to take a quantum shift in how we think about science, and not that we'll throw reduction of science out. I spent my whole career in that kind of, of realm. But for me, I was always trying, even though we were studying certain facets of things, I always was so intrigued to read broadly, to read very, very broadly about different fields and to try to think about, well, how does what we're doing with this goat in this study relate to quantum physics or whatever it would be? Just trying to link those things up. I, I think that those relationships amongst all things are really what synergy is about, what all of this ends up being about. I, I just have this feeling over and over again, it's just one thing in the end. And all these manifestations are a part of the one of the oneness. What does all that mean for people who are trying to find really regenerative and truly sustainable and healthy ways of doing agriculture? You know, I think the movements nowadays that are taking place in, in regenerative agriculture are fabulous. The interest and emphasis on soils and soil health and talking so much not just about the physical aspects of of soils, but the biological aspects of soils and appreciating that there are vast suites of herbivores, omnivores and carnivores below ground. And then thinking about that their health is linked with what we talked about earlier, the biodiversity of plants on landscapes. For me, plants are the glue. Plants are the glue that binds everything. And without them, there would be virtually no life on Earth. So they're nurturing life below ground, and they're nurturing omnivores, herbivores, and carnivores above ground. And so this emphasis in regenerative agriculture on soil health, on diversity of plants, on making sure that land is covered with plants year round. So you can continue to nurture the health of all these creatures below ground, as well as creatures above ground, bringing animals back into agriculture so that you complete the loop, so that you have the animal impacts of foraging and manure and urine being put back into those systems. And then thinking about, as we talked about earlier, the how the health of those animals and the, the characteristics of those animals when we think about the meat and milk and, and nourishment that they provide is linked with that diversity on landscapes. And then I think realizing too comes to mind something that often gets talked about. Certainly meat is a healthy component of diet and something that's a part of regenerative agricultural kinds of practices. Plants are also healthy, and I, you know, I know vegetarians who have figured out how to make all of that work for them. But sometimes people choose to eat certain foods as a function of belief systems, 
And uh, one of those is, you know, that it's, it's not good to kill sentient beings, to kill animals. And I, I appreciate when people say that, but I also think that it misses a point. You know from chapter two in the book where it talks some about plants. You know, plants are conscious. Plants have all kinds of abilities. And, and I outline all they can see, they can touch, they can sense, they can send signals to one another. Uh, they, they move, they move slowly. They have even kind of nervous systems that utilize some of the, the transmitters that ours use, a glutamine and so forth and so on. So plants are conscious. And they're sentient kind of beings. It's just that we don't see them as getting up and moving around like a dog or a cat or a human being. But I think what it, what that speaks to me about is that all life is sacred. The whole thing is sacred. And our relationships with landscapes are sacred as well. And I often think of Aldo Leopold in the last section of his book where he's talking about a land ethic. And this notion that we are members of communities, of natural communities, we're not separate from that. What we do to them, we do to ourselves and nurturing them, we nurture ourselves. And I, I think as a peoples, as a society, we've mostly lost touch with that. And I think food is one way to reconnect with that, growing things, growing not only plants, vegetable, herbal, medicinal gardens, grazing animals, having to kill an animal, that makes you realize that life is sacred. But the, the same thing with plants as well, just because they, they don't get up and move around and maybe don't squeal, they send out all kinds of signals when they're being attacked. <laughs> they send out signals to their mates, say, hey, I'm being attacked by an insect, better kick up your terpenes or whatever. They, they're sentient too. So to me, it gets back to this notion that all life is sacred. And regenerative agriculture, I think, is a, is a wonderful way that's reconnecting in, in that sense. You write in the book about two different times that really transformed your own life. The first was when you were in your late 30s, and you went into a five-year period of depression, which in retrospect, you saw as a gift. And then later in life, you got cancer, and then you emerged from that, which was another gift. How did those two experiences affect how you perceive the themes that you write about in this book, about nourishment, about seeing that kind of cycle of life that goes from the soil to the animals to us to the rain and landscape and climate cycles and all of that totally changed all of that for certain for me the depression that i experienced really caught me by surprise i'd never had a day in my life where i felt depressed just always so happy and uh, and all of a sudden as i say in the book you know i i was just so distraught, uh, had to look up to see a worm, and it just wouldn't go away year after year after year after year. A really interesting thing happened to me during that time, I, several things. They they all transformed the way I looked at everything. And, you know, in mythology, I, I mentioned Joseph Campbell in the book and his interviews with Bill Moyers in The Power of Myth. I was getting ready to go on sabbatical, my wife and two young children and I to Australia, and I had a, an editor at the Ag Experiment Station who I liked a lot, very sarcastic guy, really, I liked him a lot, but he said, you know, here, you're a sick so-and-so, I won't say what he said, you're a sick so-and-so, take this with you and read it. I was so down and out, I was ready for any kind of help that I could get, and so what he gave me, though, was the book, The the Power of Myth, that goes with that six-part video series. And I took it, and I, and my wife and I were in those days, we liked to read and read aloud to one another, and we were reading that book. And it was just about things I had wondered about since I was so young, and nobody had ever talked about those things. His whole huge, broad view of world mythologies and... Uh, their value to, to human beings and stuff. And so that, that was really, really illuminating to me to see somebody actually talking about things I had wondered about for so long. 
that time I started also reading in quantum and relativistic physics and where those folks went. And, you know, as Campbell points out, the trials transform us. It's the trials in life that transform consciousness. And like he says, mythology is about transformation of consciousness. You've been looking at the world in a particular way, and now you totally change the way that you look at the world. And that certainly happened for me with that first five years of depression. As I said, I never taught another course the same way. I never did anything the same way or thought about things the same way after that. Then 10 years later, I ended up with cancer. You know, that that was transformative as well, no question about it. And just thinking about in those days, I, this just amazing peace came over me at that time uh, with the surgery and the cancer, a peace that's beyond what, what I could ever put into words, that just is everything, I mean, everything is going to be all right. Just relax and enjoy. I don't know, I can't put <laughs> You know, and these notions that struck me for so many years of love, and I used to teach me to love, teach me to love, teach me to love, and boy, the challenges I got in the next 10 years related to that one, and then then the retirement was a third one, 10 years later, of letting go, and how hard that was, actually, because you come to, you know, we have jobs, and in my case, I loved it loved the work and we received a lot of reinforcement for the work that we were doing so many you know nice things people thought said and thought but to let all that go to move to the backwoods of Colorado that was another transformation and so good because helps I think helps a person to think that you know all of the I am's as I, you know we, we identify with with our family, with our community, with our politics, with our religion, with all those things, all the I am's. And I've often thought, you know, when we transcend all of the I am's, if we can ever do that, then we finally come to I am. So the trials transform. And I had an old friend, Bob Budd was his name, says every 10 years we need to repot ourselves. And I think it was about every 10 years I was getting repotted, even though I didn't actually volunteer for it. Right, right. Fred Provenza is author of the book Nourishment, What Animals Can Teach Us About Rediscovering Our Nutritional Wisdom. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. This program is produced in collaboration with the Kivira Coalition, a non-for-profit educational organization and community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to the resilience of arid working lands. Their work aims to shift current practices of agriculture and land stewardship to those that produce good food, support meaningful livelihoods in rural places, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A, coalition.org. You've been listening to Down to Earth, a production of the Kivira Coalition and the Radio Cafe. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domondi. If you like this program, please share it with your network. And we'd love your feedback. Go to downtoearth.media where you can contact us and you can sign up for the mailing list. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We're producing this show bi-weekly and would love your comments and ideas. So once again, downtoearth.media. And check out the Kivira Coalition, kiviracoalition.org. That's Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.